Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steph Manuel. I'm the founder of True Fiction, or a tech company that uses comics, curriculum, and community to tell the untold stories of marginalized group. And I'm here with my colleague, Susan. Would love for you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Rivers. I am Executive Director and Chief Scientist at iThrive Games Foundation. And thank All you right. for joining us for the 2022 um, Deeper Learning Conference Virtual Den. Yeah, we're psyched you're here and excited to, I'm excited to have more time with Steph. I always learn so much in our conversations and we're excited to let you listen in. Uh, and hopefully, I always get inspired by Steph. So hopefully this will inspire you too. Um, and hopefully I'll have something inspiring to say as well. Should we go? Should we get yeah. started? Yeah. All right. So Steph, you're up first. So we're gonna do this sort of interview style. We've um, each identified some questions to ask each other. And then we're just sort of gonna riff on that, show you some stuff and tell you what we're excited about uh, in terms of what we're up to. So Steph, you started the business True Fiction. How and why did that happen? What's your origin story? So uh, True Fiction started really with, you know, the one intersection of, in my life, um, and which was my first job. Um, and if you look at the screen, um, this is what I spent most of my time doing between the ages of 22 and 27. I was a combat engineering officer in the army and my primary role was to clear roads of bombs in Afghanistan. And I spent most of 2013 and 15 in Afghanistan. And during that time, that was kind of the first wave of you know, social unrest in the media. And I would come back I would come back from a mission every night and I would see all these things happening. And it kind of brought up a lot of emotions in me. You know, I wondered what was happening to my community. I wondered how did we even get to this point? And I always questioned sometimes what I was fighting for. And I felt that, and this is, this is, a, this is a younger me, I felt that my social studies and history curriculum didn't really provide me the tools to understand what was happening in my community. So I decided that I should start designing the things that I would have wished to have as a kid. And that kind of started the journey of true fiction. While I was also doing my graduate work, um, another point that led to true fiction was I would do design and research studies around how people would learn about social issues. And they would often tell me a story about experiencing racism, homophobia, misogyny, or something of the sort, and there weren't really any great tools for them to use on, um, or their parent for their parents to use. And that kind of stuck with me. And I felt like it was probably a great opportunity to combine learning about history and social studies, but also learning about all these issues that our society faces. And Susan, you're executive director of iThrive Games and you spent some time in academia. What drove you to iThrive Games? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm pulled to ask you more questions about your story, but I'll, I'll hold back because I know we have some time. Um, so I joined iThrive Games about six years ago. We were founded by a visionary who really saw a it really interesting connection between video games and adolescent development. She, Dorothy Batten, um, was raising teenage boys. She was seeing amazing connections between the positive psychology interventions and what she was seeing her boys do in video games. So collaboration, stri um, strategic thinking, um, emotion regulation. And she thought, why can't we combine positive psychology interventions with video games to create meaningful um, learning experiences for young people. Um, I came in as the first executive director of iThrive. I'd been um, at an academic institution for many, many years. And my background is social emotional learning and emotional intelligence. And I had been designing and working with uh, collaborators to create social emotional learning programs for preschool all the way to middle school. And we kept getting stuck on adolescence and high school. 
And we couldn't really crack the nut of what does great, what do great learning experiences look like for adolescents that feel cool, feel relevant, meet teens where they're at, um, and are compelling things that they want to do and really practice and stretch their skills and that don't feel preachy, you know, like an adult in front of the classroom, you know, sort of saying, this is, you know, how to live your life. This is how you need to, um, to, to show up as a human. Um, and I had recently gotten coincidentally with your background, um, a grant from the air force research laboratories to look at how to integrate emotional intelligence training into um, a virtual simulation. And so um, when the iThrive opportunity came up, I thought, oh, isn't this really cool? We could be designing environments that invite students to practice their skills. It sort of immerses them in the space and stretches um, the skills that they have, you know, self-awareness, emotion regulation, collaboration and apply it in a digital space that we may have more control over than a classroom setting. Um, realized quickly that that was not true, um, but uh, it's been a, a really fun journey to play with games to see how we can use that space to meet teens where they're at and create really fun, engaging opportunities for them to build their social emotional skills. That's great to hear. As a as a kid who always loved games, I just think they're just a great opportunity for, you know, not only the engagement, but it's a it's a fun opportunity to help them develop mental models for just thinking about problems. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think that your approach is is really fascinating too. You know, you were talking in your origin story about social justice and history. I don't think you mentioned comics. So can you, um, can we do a reveal of why comics? Yes. um, So when we originally started the research, um, the the idea wasn't comics. It was more to create, uh, let's say like a social justice kind of Netflix um, platform where there'd be a bunch of curriculum and experiences for students um, to go through. But I have a background in design innovation and human-centered design. And one of the things that we looked into was we started interviewing and working with Black parents who spent a lot of time with um, their their kids, teaching them about history, spending time with them in the library. And what we started doing design research interviews. And we started, we wanted to understand what were the patterns that they had around designing experiences that affirm students' identities and their kids' identities, made them engaged around civics and history. What were the activities they could give them or patterns of development that they had for their kids that got them excited? And then we started interviewing teachers. And when it came to history and talking about difficult moments in history or social justice, we just wanted to understand what did, what did teachers do out of fear? Like, what were the patterns of fear when it comes to being scared about saying the wrong thing, feeling that they have to stand in front of a classroom, talk about, you know, history that's very difficult and give voice to this experience and all the anxiety that comes with that. So, you know, we, we put, we, what we like to say is, you know, we put what, we looked at what Black parents were kind of doing out of love and what teachers were kind of doing out of fear and what could we connect what, what connections can be made between the two to support teachers in delivering this type of content and helping them in their daily classroom experience. Mm-hmm. And, and comic books were just a great communication medium and co- communication medium and platform um, to do that because they're highly engaging. Um, we can use a protagonist of color or protagonist from a, a historically marginalized group and they can be a voice of having these conversations. They can show a depth of emotion and character and dignity in difficult situations that, you know, it's hard for a teacher to do every time and deliver in every single classroom. And comics are a great, great tool for, um, they're a great tool um, for empathy building. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity to put yourself in someone's shoes, albeit fictional, Put yourself in their shoes and really kind of understand what they, what they were going through 
and you can start processing what you have, what would you have done? How would you have felt in the context of, in the context of history? I'm thinking back to when I, the first time I was a student and I'm dating myself um, and used a, a graphic novel or a comic book for learning. And it was um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Yep. And just how, um, how it felt to read and how it changed. Um, and I had been doing a lot of research on the Holocaust at that point, but the, the storytelling mechanics and um, techniques pull you into the experience in the story in such a different way. I love hearing you talk about um, the design decisions you've made as a comic book creator that marry imagery and the story. And there's something magic that happens when those are in alignment or even when there's a um, something surprising in that matching um, that really makes the story come alive. No, it's, and it's something that we think history should be alive. It's just, it's a story of us. So we should do our best to make it engaging and not just, you know, telling a story of a hundred people and a hundred facts that you should know. Yeah. So, you know, I do a lot of my work focusing on, you know, grade 7 to 12 and teenagers. And I know I Thrive focuses on teens as well. You know, yeah. why is this such an important time in, you know, the development of someone's life? Yeah. Oh, I was, I'm glad you asked me this question. The teen brain is so underappreciated and um, the research on the adolescent brain development and the potential and vulnerabilities of this time period is only about 20, 25 years old. And so it's not, it hasn't been around that long. We used to really focus on um, early childhood and we thought like there's this critical window where learning and development needs to happen. And if we miss that window, we're done, right? Like development's over, which couldn't be further from the truth. It is a really important time, early childhood, but there's this other big shift in development that happens in the teen years. And what the, what the data are showing, and there's really amazing studies coming out, you know, year after year too, is that the, the brain is in this moment of fine tuning. And so neural networks that we're using get strengthened during the teen years. And those that we're not using begin to, um, we call them prune out, get sort of cut, disappear away because we're not using them. And so the behavioral patterns, the thinking patterns that we really exercise during this time period um, get stronger and stronger and more efficient. And those that we don't tend to use go away. Um, and so that brain fine tuning um, matched with the sort of um, absorption quality of the brain. So teens are able to take in tons and tons of information um, at a really remarkable speed. It's really astonishing. And so it's the information, but it's also the practices. So what we see is that the practices that teens are exposed to and practice doing during the teen years actually last a lifetime. And so how do we create experiences for them that meet them where they're at, that invite them to practice different ways of thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, relationship building, self-care. What are the ones to introduce and, um, and reinforce during this time period? Because they'll last throughout the lifespan. Um, so that's one really important thing about this, that it is actually another really sensitive period that we need to take advantage of um, for teens, for the developing team. We also see that um, it's during the teen years that teens are much more focused on the social. They want to know what their friends are doing. They want to look beyond their family, which is really developmentally appropriate. And so they are, they need to take risks to step out of the comfort of their, you know, insular family, of their apartment, of their home. And so the brain is hardwired for risk-taking. And so that can be really beneficial if we want teens to be trying new things, trying on new identities, trying new behaviors, trying new um, friends, you know, new friend groups. Um, so there's tons of potential for that. And we also know with the data around 
um, drug use and um, driving risk, that it also can be um, an incredibly vulnerable, vulnerable period as well. Um, and the teen brain, and this is why I love, I know we're gonna talk about co-creation um, at some point, but this is why I love co-creating with teens because they are not um, yet jaded about how the world works. They actually, again, where their brains are developmentally, they are preconditioned to explore potential, to explore possibilities. They don't know yet all of the scripts that make up the systems that we adults are part of. There's still an element of how could this work? Could this be different? How can I um, try something new? It doesn't always have to be this way. Um, which is amazing as co-creators because I've been on this earth now for many decades and I sort of know how it goes. And so I'm sort of stuck in this um, systems thinking because I've, I've had all this experience with systems and teens are so ready to imagine something different. I don't think it's um, a coincidence that we see a lot of the social movements starting in the teen years being instigated by teens because they don't want what they see, they want something different and they, they believe that it's possible. So for me, that's incredibly exciting for how do we tap into their potential as humans and how does it shift how we design to create more compelling, more engaging um, experiences for them that build out their competencies, which they need to be thr to thrive. So the skills, the knowledges, the practices they have. Agency is incredibly important in this age group. Um, that sense of influence over the world and over the life path. So how do we create learning experiences that really tap into their um, natural inclination to feel like they're controlling something, to feel like they own their learning, that they're in control of it. I think the work that you're doing around comics so that you're interpreting and understanding as a learner is incredibly powerful. Um, and we can design lots of experiences that way. And then this idea of integrated identity, one of the tasks of development is to understand who you are in all the different places where you show up. And how are those integrated into a cohesive whole, even if it's really different in all of those different spaces and all of those different relationships. Um, and sometimes they're really disparate, which can create some confusion, some challenges. Um, and the work of the teen is to, again, try on different identities and then work to integrate them. And so for me, these are our design principles. How do we create meaningful experiences that um, allow for development of competencies, that experience of agency, and the opportunity to work on integrated identity. And what we found is that games are a really exciting way to do that. Um, so I think connected to that is um, for you and your work, um, what is the, why focus on untold stories? Like what is, what is the drive for that? And how are you um, not just telling those stories, but really thinking about the end user, the learner, both the teacher and the student in the design work um, that you're doing? What sort of design decisions do you make? How do you decide what to focus on? Um, a lot, and that's why I always enjoy talking to you. So much of what we're doing kind of connects to what you're talking about. You know, it's about identity and systems and um, identity systems and, you know, agency. So let me um, pull up a slide right quickly. And then, um, so as a, as, a, as a company that, you know, really centers itself on uh, design thinking principles, um, we have like, we have design, principle, design thinking principles on how we create our content. So we take an integrated approach to how we develop our content and we call it our gap resilience and relevance framework. And we look to target gaps where we would say, you know, stories that you generally wouldn't see in a US history te textbook. Um, and we target those by using culturally responsive pedagogy. And then we also like to tell a story of resilience of, of a marginalized group. 
And we use that story as an anchor for students to, to help students develop you know, social emotional learning skills. And then we look at relevance. Why should this even, why, why should you even care about this moment in history? And we use systems thinking frameworks to set that up. So students get the opportunity to look at a moment of history as a system of events. And you can think maybe an iceberg model, but give students the opportunity to think about where's their agency in systems? When there's a problem in society or if there is something that they have an issue with, where is the best place that they have leverage, um, leverage for change? And this kind of drives all the content curriculum professional development um, that we that we create with within within with inside the company. And the way that the way that kind of works is we're using comic books as a platform for these three things. Comic books is just an efficient way to get students involved, allow themselves to see themselves in their history education, and then use you know powerful you know, pr protagonists to kind of leverage a social emotional aspect and then use, you know, high quality art to talk about systems. And the way that kind of works is, for instance, on the left here, we have the 1944 Veterans Readjustment Act, which is known as the GI Bill, which, you know, upon returning, soldiers would get access to free education and, and housing loans. And it's one of the laws that is largely responsible for building the American middle class. However, a lot of minorities were, were kept out of that. So if you think about the GI Bill from just not just the law, but its impacts throughout time, there's families today whose grandparents, great grandparents, or you know, the family members didn't receive this. And there are generational outcomes because of this. But we often, in the context of your average history course, we don't talk about how that affected a particular marginalized community. And it's one thing to just talk about it, but it's another thing to visualize it through high quality art. So this is like one of, our, one of the panels from one of our original stories. And you have here a soldier um, and he's having, a, he's having a, a nightmare. And in the nightmare, he's reaching for the GI Bill then it crumbles within the side of his hands. And it's a great metaphor to explain what actually happened to um, a, a, lot of, a lot of GIs after World War II. And you know, we, can, we can talk about the culturally responsive aspect where we're, we're centering uh, someone's story of color. Um, you can see the range of emotions very quickly in three panels and talk about that. And you can use some of Castle frameworks to drive you know, deep and rich discussions around what's happening um, to Jude, the main character in the story. And then you can go into systems. What systems were in place at that time to even allow this to happen? And what systems propagated, you know, marginalization of this community over time? And comic books are just not comic books. Like when people say comic books are for kids, you know, I would challenge them and say that com reading comic books is it's a skill. It's putting information and in, if you look on the left, I'll kind of break it down from top to bottom, but you're, you're putting information in a graphic structure and you're asking students to uh, extract certain information. It goes into their semantic memory and then it helps them develop a situational model on how they process something or thinking about a particular situation. And what we like to do is very efficiently, we can put some high level concepts into efficient piece of art and then tie that to curriculum and standards and then tie that to professional development so teachers can be effective in the classroom. And it kind of goes back to a couple of things that you mentioned earlier around you know, agency students seeing themselves inside the content. And it's trying out different models because the real question that you know, students often ask in some of these comic books are, what would I would have done? What would I have done in this situation? How would I feel in this situation? And what's next, um, what's next for this main character as, 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 as he lives? Or what's next for his family? Um, and those are very powerful questions to your point where the teen brain is refining 
these are super powerful questions to start having students start having students ask. It's really, and I've seen some of these images multiple times, just the power, the level of detail included in one facial expression and one, you know, direction of where the face is turned, the crumbling of the GI Bill. I mean, so much is captured. That is not just, you would need multiple pages of words to describe that. And that visceral, that bodily reaction to it, that, as you're saying, like creates that memory um, that then gets unpacked and, and thought about in different ways um, is incredibly powerful as a learning mechanism, as a way to invite learners into deeply understanding really hard concepts and that activation, I think, of the emotion that visually you're inviting them into um, is just incredibly powerful. No, no, thank you, thank you. And I think, you know, comic books are a, a one good way, I think, for, uh, you know, really powerful engagement and thinking, but I think games are as, as well. Like there's so many, so many games and simulations and seeing some in, in the work I've seen, I thrive to. Um, you spent years reviewing and researching games out in the market. How did, how did you come to make your own games and, you know, what is your approach? Yeah, well, we failed a whole bunch first. It's really hard, as you know, even with a comic book, like you need world-class artists, you need world-class stories. Um, that's not just a, a little doodle. Like it takes a lot of time, a lot of investment to create a really compelling game. And what we, um, we started out trying to create our own games and realized pretty quickly, we failed pretty fast, um, that there's different levels of expertise that you need to bring to the table. Um, and it's not just finding a great game designer, but it, you got to find that great story. You got to find the, um, the, for us, the, the learning pieces, right? So we wanted to create games about empathy or emotion regulation. And we had that expertise, but our game designers didn't necessarily. Um, and it wasn't enough to give them a set of bullets or like, here's the research articles to read. There needed to be this sort of embodied understanding of the emotion that we were going after or the kind of learning we wanted to create and really work in partnership with our designers to create that. We needed to be at the table um, for that. So while we were trying to figure that out, um, we noticed that there were some many, too many amazing games on the market. And these were mostly independent games that were really rich in terms of narrative, that were really beautiful, that had some um, or a lot of relevance for teens in terms of topic, um, kind of gameplay. And we thought, well, maybe we don't have to be the ones creating the games. Maybe we can pull some of these games off the shelf and help teachers figure out how to use them in their classrooms using game-based learning techniques. But we really wanted to have that social emotional learning element to it. So we always wanted to keep the, the magnificence of the teen mind in the center of our design. So we're always going back to what do teens like? What is their brain at? Where, what do they need to, be, to um, step into this thriving or enhance their potential for thriving? Um, what are games that are inspiring, that are enticing, that are interesting? And how do those games line up with something that teachers need to do? English language arts, social studies, um, literature, like whatever it is, what's the academic topic? And then where's the potential for social emotional learning? And so just like your image, I love your image because it's very similar to this. Like how do you combine all of that into one unified learning experience? So it doesn't feel like the game's tacked on or that the English language learning arts standards are tacked on or the social emotional learning is, all right, let's talk about emotions now but that it's really baked into the whole design of the experience. And what we did, we have a series of curriculum that we developed um, that are available on our website for free download. We really wanna get this stuff out there for teachers. 
we took some beautiful, beautiful games. What Remains of Edith Finch? This is an award-winning game published by Anna Purna, created by Giant Sparrow Games. Um, and we used that as inspiration. And we thought this was a great game that told a story about um, identity and public and private identity, which is a big challenge that adolescents have. You know, how do I present myself publicly? How do I present myself privately? And how do I understand who I am? based on the artifacts that are around me. So we created a series of lessons that really dug into that concept of who am I? How do I understand another person based on what they're choosing to share with me, choosing to show on their social media or in their room or in their locker? Um, and use this as a way to um, for students to practice environmental storytelling, which is an ELA, you know, part of an ELA narrative standard. Um, we talked a lot about identity development, and we had students um, who completed this this unit say, "I never really used the word identity before, but now I'm finding I'm using it in every conversation that I'm having." Right, so it's really sparking um, agency in the learners to really dig into. Um, one of their developmental challenges and like, what is identity? What does it mean? What choices am I making to tell someone who I'm about or really understand that for myself? And then that self-awareness and self-expression. And so the gameplay is woven throughout the unit while they're digging into these social emotional skills development and exploration while they're thinking about character development and thinking about storytelling. So this is one of them. Um, another one um, is called Sam's Journey, and this uses the game A Normal Lost Phone. So this is a mystery story. You try to figure out who, um, who owns this phone that you found. And again, we're looking here at ELA um, content, so nonlinear storytelling. There's a lot of um, empathy and perspective taking in this unit. Um, and then there's also opportunity in this one to talk about bias and stereotypes. And again, when teachers use these, what they're finding is it creates um, new opportunities to um, put students in the driver's seat, because more often than not, students know how to play these games and far better than teachers do, which is exciting. That power shift is great in the classroom. Um, and it opens the door to different kinds of conversations. So when we're playing games, it actually shifts us emotionally. And I think you were saying this about the comics too, stuff is that when I'm stepping into, or I'm gonna go play this game, I think it's gonna be fun. I'm curious about what I'm gonna be asked to do in this game. I think I'm gonna be doing it with other people. So I'm open to connection. And that actually shifts our brain into a space of curiosity and openness to learning um, that creates the opportunity to engage in different ways, um, to, to deepen our potential for learning, to make us even more open to learning, which is exciting. Um, so we have these units that we've co-developed with teachers. Um, we've worked with some of the, the studios that publish these games to get free licenses if teachers want to use this. Um, and really what our hope is that we spark in teachers um, an interest in finding great games that are out there and integrating them into the classroom using some of the tools that we've created. So that's one of the things that we did is um, we decided not to design, initially not to design games because it was costly. The time period was really long. We worked on the, these set of units um, and I'll share a little later about some of the games that we actually have created um, since that. But those elements of always centering on the teen brain and that is like, that is our audience. That's who we need to design for that makes every decision in terms of design choices. And then how do you really weave the social and emotional into the academic and really leverage the game for all the power that it has? Um, the game that you showed uh, Florence is an amazing yeah. emotional game about, you know, relationships, loss, and, you know, moving on after, you know, traumatic, you know, you know traumatic experiences. And yeah. the fact that that's turned into you know, experience that students can have and then, you know, find out things about themselves. I think that's, um, that's just so, that's so powerful. Yeah. Can we talk stuff about co-design? So what do you think is important? Tell me a little bit about your process for co-design and um, how you envision that in both the work that you've done so far and where you want to go, what it means to you. 
I think I think co-design is super important because I know adults like to think this, but adults don't have all the answers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> students, you know, we live in a time where, you know, kids have access to all the information in the world um, at, the, at, the, at their fingertips and they can say what they want and we have the ability to, to produce these things. So when we first started, when I first started using um, comic books, you know, I created a really bad comic book that I'm pretty ashamed to show to anybody right now. And I created a social justice curriculum. And I just, I got a couple of teachers to teach it. And their feedback was, oh, that was a terrible comic book. The curriculum wasn't that good. But one teacher said something that I'll never forget. She said, the kids that never talk are talking. And they're having thoughtful conversation. And I don't have to force kids to talk. And the teacher who's, you know, a seasoned, seasoned, seasoned veteran was, this is just different. So I usually have to keep on poking and prodding. You know, the, the comic book really drove the discussion, but also collected a lot of data on what the students wanted. And students were very, very thoughtful and, you know, very direct on the art is terrible. I don't like this. I don't like that. I wish it had that. So we started going towards a process of, you know, we would create a couple, we, 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 we would do some storyboards, we would do a couple panels of art, and then we'd get it right in front of students and teachers and ask them for their feedback and say, how could we use this? How could this be helpful? And then we would design curriculum. And then we just kept on, we just kept on doing that over and over and over again. And the most powerful thing to us is a lot of the assumptions that we made that a lot of things we thought would work didn't work, but so many interesting things that came out of left field that we got through our design process um, just by co-creating with, with you know, students and teachers are the things that have like, st- they're the things that have stood the test of time. And when I, whenever I do a pilot or, you know, do a workshop on our work, those are the very things that people love and, they say, and that they tell me is groundbreaking. And you know, our, we originally were just only making the stories, you know, kind of in-house with a small pool of teachers and students. But what we look to go forward is, um, especially given, given, you know, right now where our country is with, you know, with trying to ban history. I mean, even, even the book Mouse you just mentioned, you know, some places are banning it. Um, we need better tools and experiences yeah. to get students and teachers to engage with their local history. So what we want to start doing is co-creating local history comic books mm-hmm. with teachers and students, either through a, a project-based learning exercise where students are kind of doing the research and they get to serve as mini producers on um, a local history story, or you know, a professional learning seminar or working with a history or social studies department to help them create local, we're giving them professional development on how to use comic books and you know, some, of the, some, of our, um, some of our frameworks, but we're also helping them get something, a product that they can use that is extremely relevant um, to their local context. And we see the power in that is, that's just not, we're getting a great comic book, getting some curriculum. Um, by going through the project-based learning exercise of creating it yourself, you get to see the power of it. It's part of you, it's part of your community, and you can see how it, it, it kind of illuminates. Like in the, in the army, um, we have a thing, we say, uh, we train as you fight. And if you create culturally responsive curriculum that has social emotional learning skills and competencies based into it that allow students to um, understand systems and their agency in it. If you create it, you kind of become it. And now you're the type of educator that can do that repeatedly with other pieces of content that you necessarily, other pieces of content, other stories that are not to your local context. And now you're an educator that has that skill set. Yeah, it's really powerful. I think that there's something about, um, how you show up when you're designing feeds into what you're creating. Um, that there's a really, um, you can feel it in the product that you're, you're putting out there is, you know, that relationship building, that collaboration, that sharing of power, that deep, genuine interest in the story that you want to tell. 
that comes through. I mean, I've seen it in the comics and the, your approach to curriculum design, it's compelling and I want to know more. I want to be part of it. Um, and it's clear that you designed those, um, in that space that, you know, that's sort of, um, contagious when you, when you engage with it. And I, I think, and I think you all are doing kind of the same thing, but with games and, and, and I, and I love this because, you know, you, you didn't say it before and I hope you can talk about it now, but I know you, you as well do a lot of co-design with teams. Can you, can you, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, we've really, um, really shifted our model so that teams are involved in every single aspect of every product that we create now. Um, and this is, I think our work with, um, with the juvenile justice system is really showcases this really well. So we started a studio program many years ago where I found um, for the same reason that you're describing in the comic book creation, um, inviting young people to design games is actually phenomenal social emotional learning um, because you have to um, evaluate what you're doing. You have to collaborate. You need to design an experience with a particular um, feeling in mind that you want your you want to invite your players in to feel. And so there's empathy, perspective taking, um, data collection. Like there's all of these different components of game design that really lend themselves to social emotional skill development. And it's creative. And in the story you were telling about um, the students who never talk and are not are now talking, there's something about um, inviting students to invade and engage in content in new ways, visual design, creative art that taps into um, different abilities, different capabilities that all of us have that often are not tapped into in a regular classroom environment and that that can get tapped into when we're designing something together or when we're reading a comic book or playing a game. And so it adds multiple layers of accessibility that in traditional instruction are lacking. Um, and so it's, for me, it's been amazing, both social emotional learning opportunities and also um, universal design for learning. So in our studio work, um, we use games to tell stories. We see games as a way to put our own experience out into a product, um, an experience that someone else can interact with. And it invites players into what that experience is, what it feels like, an element of it. Um, it creates a more comfortable opportunity to maybe have difficult conversations. Again, because you're approaching it as a game, you're approaching it as play, you're sort of open to um, learning something new, even if that thing is difficult, because you're already engaged by the time you're like, oh, wow, this is really intense. Oh, wow, this is happening. Now we can have a conversation about that. So it's sort of a softer invitation into some of those more difficult conversations. Um, great way to build empathy through games, because you're having the shared experience, you're stepping into a role or into a world that's different than your own, that you can get an initial taste of. Um, experiential, it's visual, it's tapping into so many different senses that a movie will do a little bit, a book will do a little bit, but books, which I love, I'm an active reader, um, are limited to good readers. And so um, if you're not sort of, um, if you're not a strong reader, you might lose the ability to engage in really rich, compelling content because um, the book is not speaking to you. And games create another way to engage with content. And I think comic books are the same. Um, so when we co-design with teens, whether it's a game that they're creating to tell their story or one of the simulations that we create at iThrive, um, we do, you know, this is familiar to you, Steph, you know, a design thinking approach, empathizing with the experience that we want to create, the end users, um, or the characters or the experience that we're trying to communicate in the game, um, go through process of defining what is the topic, what are, what's the research say, what is the problem, 
um, brainstorming and ideating, prototyping, testing, and refining all the way through. Um, this is really the, the bulk of our, our programming of how we get to games. And we have a whole bunch of activities that really support um, these kinds of engagements. We just published um, our game design studio toolkit, um, which you can download for free on our website um, that integrates social emotional skill building with um, design activities. Um, and this is just one of the games that um, I had the privilege of supporting a group of young people on creating. And as um, my role is guide and facilitator, and then the designers take me to where they want to go. And so we got some funding from the William T. Grant Foundation to um, really try to understand the lived experience of young people who are um, living or have experience within or adjacent to the cradle to prison pipeline. And um, where we've taken this work is using games to tell pieces of their stories, but then use these games that they create to engage stakeholders in conversations to dismantle systems of inequity. So this game is the runaround and it was created by some of our designers who had recently, um, actually we started developing this when they were um, incarcerated and in prison and then they continued to work with us when they got out. Um, and what we wanted, to, what they wanted to capture in this game is what does it feel like to be a human being inside a prison? And some really mundane feelings, I mean, really strong feelings, but it's boring it's lonely, it's really frustrating. There's all of these rules there that make no sense. And so they baked that into this game design so that as a player, you're experiencing those things. You can go rounds and rounds where you don't do anything. You're just sitting there waiting for your turn, hopeful that you'll, you'll move, but then you don't because the deck is really literally stacked against you. Um, and as they were doing this, they began to unpack what is the structure of the system of the juvenile justice system? What is the structure of the parole system? How are, how, why are those designed the way that they are? How are they designed? Are they designed to support our development, our potential as humans or to hold us back? And so we use this game where they facilitate workshops and conversations where the game is, is one of the centerpieces for how would you change the design of this game? How would you change the rules? How would you change the mechanics? How would you change what the game board looks like to dismantle the inequity that we see or dismantle the um, design of the system so that instead of holding people back and punishing them is really seeing their potential and creating opportunities, creating opportunities for nurturing, for caring, for jobs, for school. And, through the design, as opposed to something like a survey or something like an interview, um, it's not just language based. You know, they're making choices as we're seeing in your comic books too of what the characters look like, what colors are we going to choose, what does the font look like, and all of those decisions are really intentional to tell the story that sometimes words just don't capture, or that even as someone living through an experience that continues to be unfolding haven't even formed the words yet to describe. And that's coming through sort of that creative, that creative act. Um, yeah, it's incredibly powerful and humbling work to, to sit alongside our, our young designers. It's such a just great way of, you know, really, really synthesizing an experience into like a, a, a concrete experience for others to go through to drive empathy. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have so many different narratives on, you know, you said creative a prison school, the prison pipeline and what it, what it, what it actually looks like, but what are, what are like the real world experiences and how could, how can that help us understand future poly decisions or just generally how we, how we understand that. And I think that's just a great way and the way we're doing it, but also what you said about, it's really hard to create thoughtful and meaningful content or games or experiences. There's so many micro decisions at every step that make it something meaningful. 
And if you, if people are not provided that experience or taking those decisions, you don't, you just get something that just doesn't work. Like you don't know why it doesn't fit. Yeah. It just kind of doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. That was always the, um, you know, I think one of my biggest lessons from all of the work that I've been doing is so much of who we are as humans, so much of the human experience, our emotions are central to yet so much of the teaching practices and learning experiences that are in traditional classrooms don't allow the emotion in. And so um, it's, it's just such a missed opportunity. And so, you know, I'm so committed to um, creating tools, creating experiences that invite um, learners, invite teachers to make emotion central to learning because emotions are central to learning. If you're feeling hopeless or if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling scared or frustrated, you're not available to learn and you're not available to teach. And so why do we put emotions to the side when we can make them really by design part of what we're learning and use the emotions? And even if we are frustrated, all right, well, let's talk about that frustration. Why is this content really hard? Um, Let's map how our frustration aligns with the kinds of problems that we're doing and how do we understand what's difficult for us and sort of building in those opportunities to engage in self-reflection, really think about how emotions impact our bodies and our brains um, and can really support deep learning. And I see that um, stuff really actualized in your comics. I'd love for you to, to talk if you're willing to about some of the choices you've made and some of your um, your panels that um, open up the space for our talking about emotions and the different choices that you've made and in, in color and tone um, to really make that that come alive and create the opportunity for those conversations. Yeah. So, in when you t- and when in, I'm glad you brought this up about you know emotions. Um, without emotions, where are where where's our agency? Yeah. And if we don't have agency in um, our learning experiences, are we really going to learn? Are we going to be excited to learn? Um, and as a former army officer, I was you know, responsible for soldiers training. And one of the most important tools that we would use for training is ensure that soldiers have agency in what they're learning, that mm-hmm. this learning experience is directly tied to um, their identity. And once that happens, it's so easy to not have the motivation to learn because it's just not an abstract standard. Yeah. This is about me. And we kind of I take that kind of perspective inside of the, the comic books is that we are designing them. We are, we are, we are designing the, com- the comic books for, you know, for raw emotion. We have the full expectation mm-hmm. that some of the panels may make you feel uncomfortable but that's that's kind of the point for you to engage with something that makes you uncomfortable for you to think about why does it make you feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. and for you to kind of process those, process those emotions and what's also powerful about a comic book is that everyone's going to read it the same read it differently no one reads it the same so as you're going as you're following this character's emotional journey people focus on different emotions throughout the comic book Mm-hmm. And at, once you start having a conversation about a particular character's journey, you get to see how people just feel differently about things. Mm-hmm. And that, that discussion also helps you feel differently about things because you may just have missed something. Like where in one of our, one of our stories, you know, there's a, very, there's a couple of moments where we show a soldier, you know, going through PTSD. And sometimes some people don't catch it. We see a soldier going through depression sometimes, but we also see times where he's extremely motivated to join the civil rights movement. And we show times where other soldiers are coming together to provide community and support for the main character. But when we have discussions in the classroom about what's going on, people don't always pick up on the same things. It's very powerful. And we do that by design to allow people to kind of tap into different emotions and process different emotions around, um, around the comic book.
I'm pausing because I'm wondering if you're going to show us something or not. Oh, um, <laughs> let me. No pressure. No pressure. I think I. I think I know. Let me. Let's continue because it may take me a while to pull it up. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Anyone who's listening, check out his stuff on True Fiction's website. There's just the artistry in the comic books is just so compelling and um it's just powerful i mean the the way that staff is is telling stories again with teens at the center of um receiving those stories and interacting with them and and deepening their understanding and even opening actually, 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 I can, I can do you pull, find it i could pull i could pull one up right okay. now cool. um, so this is uh this is um this is one of our comic books called Jews War, and it looks at the experience of an African American World War II veteran after the war. And going from left to right, when we think about emotions and social emotional learning content, um, we see a splash page on the left where the main character Jude's walking through the street, and he's dealing with the cognitive dissonance of fighting fighting for freedom in another country and you know experiencing traumatic experiences but on his on his return to the u.s still dealing with traumatic experiences around racial and racial violence and it kind of shows you know just the tension that is there in this soldier's mind and we do this uh, we do this by design for people to have that discussion for themselves and think about how they would potentially empathize with this main character. And in the middle middle panel, you know, the main character, Drew, is in a bar drinking because he is is kind of stressed. But we show show some images where other other Black men for his community come up to him and say, and comfort him that despite, you know, the traumatic experiences that you're having, you are a human being. You are a person. You have value. And we want to give teachers and students the opportunity to jump into this and say, where does that happen within my community? How can I be that type of person to someone else in need? And then on the, on the, on, on the, on the right, on the final, kind of the final, one of the final panels in the story is, how does support from the left, the middle panel, drive the main character to you know, fight for you know, fight for his rights to join the civil rights movement, um, and all of these are de- by design to have you know really difficult conversations around history. Talk about not in to talk about history not just from a way of just series of facts and laws, but okay, what is the emotional content around you know a lot of the facts and laws and dates around history because history is a story of real people and how do we how do we get students and teachers to engage with that story amazing amazing so steph what's what's next for true fiction what's coming up for you well we we have a couple things um one we originally started with we uh, originally started with African American history, of Black history, um, and we just want, and really that was really primarily driven because I, I I'm Black and I wanted to get my history right <laughs> before doing other people's history. But um, for this year, we're going to start actually branching out into an ethnic studies anthology. So because our our eventual goal is that regardless of how you identify, you can see yourself meaningfully meaningfully represented in U.S. history. From about 1600 to now. So we're going to be launching our first ethnic studies anthology towards the end of the year. The other things, uh, among the other things that we'll be doing is continuing to work on our our co-creation products. We'll be partnering with institutions to help them create um, locally focused stories that have um, national significance. And one thing that we also want to do and we find it super important to do now is because of, you know, we talked about the power, I talked about the power of comic books. Um, there's also a great data collection opportunity to help teachers and students 
you know, think about, get data on how they learn and process images and also give teachers the opportunity to deliver personalized interventions for students. So one thing that we're currently um, developing at the moment um, is a self-reading app where we take um, our comic books and our content and our approaches and we put them into an app that either can be used within the classroom or outside of the classroom um, for students. And what we're allowing students to students to do is develop SEL skills through like anti-racist digital experiences, but we're collecting data on culture responsive pedagogy, social emotional learning, and systems thinking. And what, we're, what we wanna to provide to teachers is that after students kind of go through a series of these self-paced or even classroom-based experiences, you get to collect data on students' emotional journey through these difficult moments of history and you know, tie their emotions to when they stop reading or when they continue reading, tie their emotions to how do they process systems thinking or difficult concepts. So a teacher then can look at a particular student and say, I understand a student's emotional journey in the context of their learning. When is the best time to give them an intervention? When is the best time to give them a nudge? When's the best time to give them a different piece of content that can still push them to complete the assignment or motivate them to um, motivate them to do the work and motivate them to read higher levels of, of content? Because what we find with a lot of students is they really enjoy the comic books and they see it as a visual, a visual, I would say as a visual inquiry exercise, but then they want to know more facts about it. And they're motivated to go read a primary source document. They're motivated to go read, you know, a comp, uh, an article that may have a, a higher Lexile score. And that's a super powerful, not just from, you know, a history and social studies perspective, but a general just literacy and um, understanding of the world. This is so exciting. I'm really, um, I love how your brain works and I love how you're really thinking um, about the whole student and opportunities to really stretch their social emotional skills as they're digging into history. Cause it is, as we said, so interconnected. And what I see in that app is um, just really leveraging that to support the learning um, and expand the learning. And I'd be super excited to know, you know, what is I Thrive Games and what's what's in store for your work over the next 12 months? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's so many um, synergies and what you're up to and what we're up to. And I think the thing I want to highlight is we are super curious about how we can best create experiences that actively engage students tapping into their social emotional skills. And so how do we, what tools can we create? What games can we design that invite students to self-regulate in the moment, to make responsible decisions in the moment, to build and grow their self-awareness while they're engaging with civics content, history content. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing that is through our I Thrive Sim platform, which we just released this fall. And so you can see here, kids are playing the game, right? So this is a classroom, but and this game has sort of surrounded the space, but they're active, they're engaged, they're debating with each other, they're solving problems. Um, and tech is enabling that, but it's not taking over the experience. So we have this, um, lost my mouse somehow, here we go. Um, we have this platform that we built that um, sets up a role-playing simulation. It's web-based, it's very user-friendly. Um, and so it sets the scene for uh, a problem in civics. And so our first story is on a global pandemic and you're our state senator or state governor and you need to decide, do you keep your economy closed and keep stay at home orders in place or do you open up the economy and you need to work with five other state governors to make a decision because your choices impact them and the health of their state and the economy of their state. And so across 45 minutes, 
each player is getting different information that's timed. Some of them get the same, some of them get different, um, but they all need to come together to make decisions together. And what you decide impacts what happens. And so we have a series of games now focused on civics education um, that really weave the social emotional skill building into gameplay and asks students to show up, invites them to show up, whether they're online over Zoom or physically in the classroom to engage in um, the behavior of civics, which is being present, listening, having empathy, negotiating, being assertive, um, regulating through times of stress. And that sort of exercise space of the social emotional skills tied with the civics um, really gets at the core of what does it mean to be civically engaged? It's understanding, you know, maybe legislation, it's understanding executive powers, legislative powers, state powers, federal powers, um, but it's also interacting with others. It's also stretching your skills and regulating your emotions, um, how to make decisions in times of crisis. And so what I'm most excited about is everyone in America playing these games and also what do we need to design next? What's the next, um, either simulation that can really tap into teens' magnificent power and where they're at developmentally? Um, and how do we tie that to real actionable learning goals that can support teachers in creating really amazing learning environments for young people? Um, and how can we co-create with teachers? How can we put out tools? How can we invite teachers in to co-create those experiences either with us or in their classrooms without us entirely? Um, Cause for me that co-design and that creating those immersive experiences are where the future of education is going or needs to go. Um, I, I completely agree. I, I think, you know, the design process and our ability to design at scale um, yeah. is the perfect time for these types of resources um, in education as, you know, we all know the pandemic is, has done a number, it's continuing to do a number and disrupting what we think education can and should be. And I think this is a great opportunity to explore, you know, how can we co-design, how can we provide new resources to support, mm -hmm. you know, our teachers and you know, our, really our, our future leaders. Yeah. Yeah. And they're ready. You know, they, they so readily tell us what they like, what they dislike, what they want, what they need. Um, so let's, let's listen to our, our teens, our high school students and work with them to design amazing content that can last for the, the younger students coming up behind them. So Steph, always inspiring to talk to you. I love your work so much. I'm so honored that I get to collaborate with you and that, um, I'm part of helping share the amazing work of true fiction, um, in this deep dive den. And so it's, it's always a pleasure for us, to, you know, kind of riff on the things that we're, we're building and creating. And um, it's always it's always a pleasure to see like minded, mission driven um, organizations out there. If we're trying to have a you know, positive impact for you know, our, our youth and our society. Well, thanks for joining us today. We are so honored to be part of this um, conversation and this conference. And um, Steph, always a pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone.